My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at the Harvard Kennedy School. We want to welcome everybody to tonight's John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Tonight we're going to talk about two things we should never talk about in polite company, <laughs> religion and politics. Mm -hmm. Last night when I was talking with my eight-year-old daughter about tonight, she said, what's, uh, what's the topic going to be? And I said, religion and politics. And she said, what, did that, what does what do they have to do with one another? I'm like, well, come to the forum, you'll learn. So we're really excited about the topic tonight. There are a lot, those two terms have a lot to do with one another. And we've got a great panel tonight uh, to talk about this. Uh, our panel tonight is going to be moderated by Anna. Um, Anna's not actually going to be moderating the panel. Lori Goodstein is moderating the panel. She's the religion correspondent for the New York Times. And fortunately for us, she was coming to Boston to do a college tour with her son, who I will not embarrass by pointing out that he's in the front row. Uh, but we're really excited to have her. Uh, we, we were calling her anyway, and it turned out it was perfect timing. So we're really excited to have her tonight, and she's going to introduce the rest of the panel. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So election 2012 was supposed to be about the economy. Remember that? Jobs, the deficit, remember where that's what, where we're supposed, where our heads are supposed to be at. But a funny thing happened on the way to the Iowa caucuses. Um, religion is once again a factor, and religion is a factor in very surprising ways this time. We have a Mormon front runner who is winning the Catholic vote. We have not one, but two Catholic challengers, uh, Rick Santorum and Newt Gingrich. Um, who are turning off Catholics, um, but uh, are being held aloft by evangelicals. Um, and in a country where, if you think about it, every recent presidential inauguration, the president has mentioned uh, in, in their address an appreciation for Americans of every faith, including Americans of no faith. So in a country that is that attentive to faith, Public religious freedom, and whether it's threatened in this country is also a front burner issue. So um, if you have seen some of the photography from, uh, from uh, primaries and uh, seen uh, people who are attending these primaries, you'll see people holding signs that says, Obama, leave my religion alone. So these are all very surprising you know, appearances of you know, religion in, in this political primary process. So what is going on here? Um, so we have a wonderful panel tonight to help us analyze this and explain some of the twists and turns. Um, from my left, uh, Governor Ted Strickland is currently at the Institute of Politics as a resident fellow. He's the former governor of Ohio, six-term congressman. Um, before politics, he received a Master's of Divinity from Asbury Theological Seminary and served as an ordained Methodist minister. So you are doubly qualified to be with us tonight. <laughs> Charles Stiff, to his left, um, is currently the director of the African Presidential Archives and Research Center at Boston University. Before this, he served as US ambassador to Tanzania. Um, he's also served on the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. And he was a senior minister at the Union United Methodist Church in Boston. So, this is the Methodist Triply corner. Qualified. Right. Yeah, we have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we probably should do religious identities here. Is that fair? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Anna Greenberg is a leading pollster and an expert in survey research methodology with nearly 15 years of experience. She's currently senior vice president at Greenberg Quinlan Rossner, uh, a premier research and strategic consulting firm. And she's been doing polling that is right on point to what we're talking about tonight. Um, Richard Parker is a lecturer in public policy and senior fellow at the Joan Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. He was co-founder of Mother Jones and currently is the chair of the editorial board of The Nation magazine. So um, welcome to a great panel. And I thought to get started, uh, a very open-ended question, but for each of you, about what has surprised you most about the appearance, the infusion of religion um, in this primary process this year? Let's start with that. Well, okay. I'll, I'll start Ambassador. it off. Mm -hmm. two, two things. I mean, on the, the, uh, the political side, the thing that has surprised me is that, as you mentioned in your intro, given the focus that we thought we were going to have on the economy, 
that fundamentalist uh, religious values have taken center stage to the extent that they have, have surprised me. Uh, and also because I don't think that's a winning formula, which uh, I, I found surprising. On uh, the, the religious side, the, the thing that surprised me about the way this is unfolded is that there's been this focus on, on, on Christian fundamentalism and almost no discussion about Mormonism. Uh, and given that uh, 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 Romney is a, a bishop uh, in, in the Mormon church, uh, has been historically very active, and with this focus on faith and values, politics and policy, mm -hmm. uh, I've been surprised that uh, that hasn't uh, been uh, a more of a point of focus. And, and then finally, uh, I've been struck by the, the fact that the, the more liberal wing of the, the Protestant uh, connection hasn't weighed in mm -hmm. at all on some of these issues that have been framed in very, very divisive ways. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk more about that, I think, right? Well, I mean, I, I agree with all the points that were made. I mean, I thought that there would be a much more robust discussion of Romney's faith than there has been. Um, we've done a little bit of experimental research that looks at the impact of him being a Mormon. And there is, it's just like when Obama was running for president, it was very hard to measure how his race affected people's uh, inclination to vote for him because people aren't going to say to a pollster, I don't want to vote for, um, you know, a black candidate for president. Similarly, it's hard. It's not as... You know, we don't have the same kinds of issues around someone being a Mormon, but it's still people don't want to say, oh, I wouldn't vote for someone because they're a Mormon. And with some experimental work we've done, it does have an impact in the Republican primary electorate mm -hmm. to, to some degree. And I think that that is part of why there's lots of reasons why I think evangelicals in the Republican primary are not that supportive of Romney. But I think that is still part of it, even if there isn't an open discussion about it. Um, the thing that has surprised me is not so much the way religion is um, sort of present because we have a very competitive and active Republican primary. And you know, one of the most important groups within the Republican primary electorate are evangelical Christians who are driven by a particular set of issues. Um, and I, I am, though, surprised that Santorum is doing as well as he <laughs> is. What I'm surprised about is the, the issue of, of contraception and a whole range of women's health issues and how prominent those issues have become. Mm -hmm. They have been really active since um, the Republican sweep in 2010, um, you know, in, the, in Congress and also at the state level, and even though there have been you know 900 you know anti-abortion laws introduced across the country, it's still been relatively under the radar. Mm -hmm. And the way it is kind of so it's been going on, whether it's contraception or abortion or you know Planned Parenthood or Title 10, there's been a lot of activity on the right, but it seemed to have just exploded. Uh, and now won't go away. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because the press is covering, it's because of the things that, you know, people, you know, Romney talks about defunding Planned Parenthood. You've got, you know, Governor Corbett in Pennsylvania saying that if women don't like the invasive ultrasound, they don't have to look at it. So, I mean, they're fueling it. And, you know, as someone who works as a Democratic pollster, it's not particularly helpful for the general election. It may be helpful in the primary, but it's not particularly helpful in the general election. Mm -hmm. We're going to get into that a little more. I, I, I'd echo uh, some of what both uh, the speakers have said. I, I, I think that the presence of religion in this cycle is a function of Mitt Romney's inability to knock off the other candidates early. Secondly, the mm -hmm. fact that the Republicans have allowed there to be too many debates. And third, the desperation of the press for issues to hang the election on. And ultimately, for Romney's competitors to find wedge issues to drive against Romney. Uh, I agree with the ambassador. I'm surprised that Mormonism hasn't come up, but I think uh, Anna recognizes that it is a little difficult to play an openly Mormon card any more than it's one plays an openly Catholic card the way it w that was played in the primaries in the Democratic Party in 1960, for example. Uh, but it's perverse because in this cycle, we're now almost 15 years away from what I think of as the tail end of the last big upsurge of uh, religious conservatism in America. In the 20th century, there were three big surges in the 1920s, in the 1950s, and then in the 1980s and 90s. And the moral majority went bankrupt 20 years ago. The Christian coalition has been dead for 15 years. Uh, Ralph Reed is peddling Indian casinos along with Jack Abramoff rather than working for the, for the, ho the holiness of the American spirit. Uh, and, and so we're in an echo period from that upsurge. And so 
to find the Republicans caught on the back end of this cycle in this particular way speaks to me more about the difficulties of the Republican Party generally looking forward than anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it's not a surprise as much as a mm -hmm. disappointment mm -hmm. that, um, that in this time, um, religion has become so polarizing and is being used politically uh, in such a divisive way. Um, I, uh, you know, as a, I guess, a liberal Democrat, I, I would like to think of maybe this being the death rattle of the uh, cultural conservatives uh, trying desperately one last time to hold on to something that no longer exists. Uh, and to think that we're talking about contraception when the, the, the problems that face this country are as severe as they are um, is, is nearly unbelievable. And I, you know, I don't say that euphemistically. It, it is nearly unbelievable mm -hmm. to think <laughs> that we could be talking about uh, contraception, that we could be talking about whether or not a woman would be subjected to an invasive procedure that I think she would have to pay for. Um, you know, and then to have a governor say she doesn't have to look at the ultrasound. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's almost as if you know, we're seeing a deterioration uh, of, our, uh, of our political discourse in a way that is well, maybe I am surprised, but I am also disappointed that this is happening. So talk about why this is happening. When I started at the New York Times in 1997, and one of, as a religion writer, one of the first stories I did was about um, you know, the implosion of the Christian Coalition. Right. Uh, because that organization in, in those years uh, that Ralph Reed and Pat Robertson had built that was powerful enough to put uh, voter guides uh, on the seats of uh, you know, uh, every pew, every megachurch in the country, at least conservative megachurch, um, really had a tremendous reach and then just kind of dissolved. And um, I, I wrote this story about the end of the Christian coalition, but I also remember questioning whether that meant it was the end of um, the religious right or the culture wars. So why, why do you think it hasn't gone away? And also, I mean, you know, what, it, is it really, is this really a, the, the death knell or are we seeing something, uh, something different? Um, is this with us, you know, to stay? Are we going to be living with this? Um, I, I think it's important to distinguish between a voting base that has strong faith beliefs that then attach themselves to political issues uh, and uh, institutions that intermediate between the electoral system and those voters. And what you were coming in on was the tail end of these powerful, a powerful series of these institutions that had mobilized this block in a way that allowed them to describe themselves as a religiously organized block. But those groups weren't, ever, the economics of them weren't sustainable. They were constantly overexpanding. I think I remember some of your early reporting was on Christian coalition misrepresentations of the number of pamphlets distributed, mm -hmm boxes of pamphlets found in dumpsters outside of Christian coalition offices <laughs> and all the rest. And that's exactly what had been going on a decade earlier with the moral majority, that the press didn't have the capacity to check a lot of the claims. The leaders of these groups knew that, uh, and so they would make claims about the extent of their influence that was far beyond their actual reach. That didn't mean that there wasn't an angry, mobilized voting base. But the fact of the matter was that most of the issues that were pushed by that voting bloc on Republican presidents, whether it was uh, Rob, uh, uh, Reagan or the first George Bush, didn't come to fruition. They didn't get what they wanted on issues of abortion. They didn't get what they wanted on right. uh, a whole host of what I think of as the body issues, mm -hmm. which always are all about women's bodies, not <laughs> men's bodies, but let's not go there. Um, but they didn't get them, and, and so a combination of the inability to deliver what was promised, plus mismanagement uh, would be the kindest word for it, caused those organizations to implode. So what you're getting, I think, is echoes out of the voting base that the, elector, the, that the candidates are trying to tap into as wedges right now in the primary to gain some leg on, on Mitt Romney. How successful they are, we'll see. Religious um, divisions are still incredibly important when it comes to 
organizing campaigns and targeting voters. And I mean, one of the things that the Bush campaign did, especially in 2004, amazingly well, was micro-target religious voters yep. through the use of big consumer databases, but also getting church roles and adding them to their databases. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we do these modeling exercises, we actually want to know something about whether it's their denomination or their level of religiosity, because that helps us figure out who we should target and not target. And that's really not going away, right. um, even if organizationally the Christian right is sort of, it's an echo. Um, I do think, though, there's a cultural relevance issue here. I am struck. Another thing that I'm surprised about is how little LGBT issues are a part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. We have uh, four states that are going to have marriage amendments on the, on the ballot, mm -hmm. um, Washington, Minnesota, Maine, and North Carolina. Um, and those will be, I think, get a lot of attention as we get closer to Election Day. But there is silence coming out of the Republican primary relative to abortion and contraception. And I just think it's because culturally this country is shifting so fast on these issues right. that I think that even as um, they're trying to play to base voters, they know that dealing with LGBT issues is a, is a non-starter in the general election. So are, there's a relevance issue, too, I think, for these, these social issues. These are, are these like Prop 8 measures, yes. like we saw in California? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, okay, well, so in are, some states, they are to overturn mm -hmm. what the legislature has passed. In mm -hmm. other cases, it's to, over, it's to actually introduce, like in North Carolina, it, at its level of statute, it's already illegal for gay people to get married. Mm -hmm. Now they want to put it in the Constitution. So it's different. It's slightly different in each state. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, 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 I'd use another word. We've used uh, surprised, disappointed. I want to throw in perplexed. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've, I've, <clears throat> up until the, the, the 2008 cycle, and I, and I give, give money, Governor, okay. but I decided once I became older than the president, it was time for me to probably retire to some other capacities <laughs> in terms of electoral politics. But having been fairly intimately involved in presidential politics since Carter, uh, I was ready to buy the conventional wisdom that the Republican Party uh, was so hell-bent on getting, rid of, get, getting rid of President Obama that they would swallow about anything, which uh, was also part of the, the I think, the raison d'etre of the Romney campaign. And for the life of me, I just don't understand. Not, maybe the pollster can help me with this. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I can't understand for the life of me why these guys have zeroed in on these kind of, of wedge issues, which, uh, you know, I, I heard the point about kind of micro-targeting certain constituencies in order to get over the hump, but they've got to appreciate that this stuff is toxic going into uh, the general election. And uh, the, the governor and I were talking backstage that from the perspective of the Obama campaign, man, you couldn't have written this script any better. My only comment would be that, you know, this is the primaries. And they've right. got, they can't have, they can't compete in the general unless they win the primary. Yeah. And the, the truism that the press carried around at, the, at this point last year was evangelicals are going to be very tough to line up on Romney. And the evidence now is... That's not true. The evangelicals are split in interesting ways. A third of evangelicals appear to be voting for Romney, roughly, in a number of these primaries. There are exceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you realize that these voters are perfectly capable of being tactical voters as well as being committed to their sense of values. I learned that back in the 88 race when Pat Robertson decided he wanted to be president and ended up spending $15 million and got one, one vote at the Republican convention because his voting base wasn't going to vote for Pat Roberts because they knew Pat Roberts would never be elected president. Mm -hmm. So you have to remember that we're in the midst of a primary right now. And the spread between these guys is very close in a lot of these states, surprisingly closer than anybody has thought. Romney keeps holding on to a polling advantage. He's lost it a couple of times, but he seems to be up right now. But they've got to close the deal. But and I, they haven't closed the deal. I get primary politics. Okay. I get primary politics. Yeah. But in, in, in every cycle, we've seen, uh, particularly with front runners or people who are really in play, we've seen them historically find at least one uh, hook on which to hang their hat that gives them some tacking room back toward the center. Uh, with Clinton, it was the sister soldier moment. Uh, you know. It, it, They've always found a way to say, okay, I've got to play to my base, but 
you know, I'm prepared to come back toward the center in order to put myself in a position to be elected. And just when you think you might see somebody tack back toward the center, they go further right. Their base is further away from the yeah. center than the Democratic base well, is. Well, I, you know. you know, I, was, I was going to ask that. Yeah. What does this say about the Republican Party today? H has, it, has it moved? Uh, yeah. oh, yes. It has. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, part of what happened in 2010 in particular was that so many moderate, to the extent that there were any left, moderate Republicans got primaried by Tea Party candidates that you lost a huge, you had a couple of things happen. I mean, you had a lot of Republicans lose in the Northeast and other places that really were blue areas of the country, just as you saw that kind of adjustment in the 90s in the South. But you also had a lot of moderates get pr primary. I mean, I'm sure that's why Snow decided not to run for a re-election in, in Maine. Um, and so institutionally, you don't have a base of pragmatic, moderate Republicans in the leadership of the party. And even someone like John Boehner, who's very conservative mm -hmm. and gets it, has very little operating room in Congress. Mm -hmm. So I think that there, there's, a, there's a problem with a kind of party that's out of power, that's moved farther right, both at the level of the voter, but also institutionally, and nobody has a lot of control over it. They don't have a president who sort of has control over it. Um, and it or leads state party operations that right, control. Right, right. A lot of it fell apart after Bush you know, left office. A lot of the infrastructure that Rove created sort of went away. Mm -hmm. McCain didn't really have the infrastructure that Bush did when he ran for president. And the Tea Party, um, let's talk a little bit about the Tea Party and the role of the Tea Party. And the Tea Party was characterized as primarily you know, uh, about the economy and Absolutely. taxes and all that. What, what are we learning about this, about who the Tea Party is or the Venn diagram that is the Tea Party and the religious right? What's the best way to describe what's going on? Well, I, I mean, I think the Tea Party I mean, uh, perhaps started out as focusing on the economy, but mm -hmm. that seems to have changed rather dramatically. And it seems as if the Tea Party has been taken over by the religious right. Um, I don't see any really difference between those who say they're Tea Party advocates and those who you know, consider themselves evangelical, you know, um, uh, pe pe people who are concerned about these moral issues. And I I'm perplexed too. I've moved from disappointed <laughs> to perplexed because I thought that Romney would emerge as the stable, thoughtful, mature business leader who would present a serious challenge to the president. You know, and now he's saying, even if the Congress were to pass, for example, the DREAM Act, mm -hmm. which, which applies to children who were brought here as children uh, through no fault of their own, he says, I would veto it. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I see him trying to go to the right of Newt Gingrich, and it's, 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 it's a race to the right, but my question is, where are the traditional Republicans? The, you know, the more moderate, are, are they out there? Or have they just disappeared? Mm -hmm. Well, they don't participate in Republican primaries anymore. They call themselves independents. I mean, there's, there's been, a, a, the composition of the, of the primary electorate has changed over time. Where will they go in the fall? Well, I mean, up until the last two months, independents were breaking for Romney. But I actually, both the combination of, I think, the economy getting better, which has helped Obama, just lifted him generally and improved his performance among ind independents, I do think the Republican primary overall has not been helpful with independent voters. And some of it, a, a good deal has to do with the social issue, because the social issue piece of it, because independents tend to be economically conservative and socially moderate. I don't say liberal, but more moderate. Mm -hmm. And so they're sort of, these independent voters are perplexed, like why are we having this conversation? Mm -hmm. um, and so as Romney moves farther to the right, pushed there by Santorum and Gingrich, he alienates independent voters. Now, I think there's plenty of time for them to come back to Romney if he can shut this thing down. Mm -hmm. But um, that's, independents are you know, now sort of evenly split between Romney and, and Obama. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that, that's another consideration, which is the paying attention issue. I was just looking at some Pew data on uh, people paying attention to this whole Catholic bishops contraception uh, being paid for by insurance issue. Only about a third of the country says that they're paying much attention at all. I mean, a mm -hmm. third says they've heard about it. A third, amazingly, not from this room, I suppose, have said they've heard nothing about it. Yeah. Okay. So really, oh, that's very interesting. Well, the, they probably um, don't read the Times. They're not reading my the work. General <laughs> they're, they're, they're oh, exactly. they are. <laughs> oh yes, they are. <laughs> when that issue emerged, um, it was framed uh, very intentionally, very differently. It was framed that this is not about contraception. 
This is about religious freedom. Yeah. Um, the Catholic bishop said that uh, the issue was, is every, everybody here is, is familiar with this issue, right? That um, their, uh, the new HHS rules, Health and Human Services rules um, uh, for the new uh, health program, require that even religious institutions like Catholic um, hospitals or Catholic universities would be required to uh, have, in have insurance plans that cover contraception. And so the Catholic bishop said, you're violating our religious freedom. And they had, uh, it, you know, right out of the block said, we have allies on this. Our allies are, uh, you know, conservative Christian colleges. In fact, there's been, I think now, seven or nine lawsuits filed against this requirement. And a number of the lawsuits are by uh, evangelical colleges, not, not Catholic colleges. You have also um, Orthodox Jewish, uh, you know, allies on this. So the bishop said it's not even about Catholic teaching, it's not about contraception, it's about religious freedom. But very, very quickly, um, they, you know, the framing of the issue did shift from religious freedom to it's about the right to, uh, you know, have uh, birth control paid for. How, how did that happen? Um, and is, it, is there any way in which that religious freedom issue is alive for, you know, a, a section of... Uh, voters. Is, I, I, does it matter to some I think the Catholic people? bishops have been very savvy and they're getting good media advice because anything that talks about the Catholic Church and sexuality is not what they want to have talked about in public right now, mm -hmm. whether it's women or men. Uh, so ch framing this as a religious freedom issue, I just appreciate as a tactical maneuver by them to be very shrewd because talking about sexuality is not something the church is in a position to talk about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I find so interesting is that, you know, when you frame it as a religious liberty question, you still get Catholics pretty evenly divided on the question of whether they support the church or not. And again, religious liberty issues are kind of reflexively, oh yeah, I support that, usually. So when you have this kind of split, it tells me that the Catholic Church leadership is having, again, real difficulty bringing its base along and that that's probably the most important thing to watch as we move forward into the general. Not so much Catholics who voted in Republican primaries, but Catholics who will vote in the general. But don't you think the shift from religious freedom to contraception mm -hmm. uh, came from Rick Santorum primarily? And then, I mean, he, he, I mean, he, he, he talked very openly well, about... He's had that issue for a decade. I mean, you know, well, I, but I that's think old the, territory. The issue is that, as I said earlier, 2010 kind of Republican wave at both the federal level and state level, a lot of elected officials came in, issues of reproductive rights, whether it was abortion or contraception or sex education or Title X, mm -hmm. these were very important issues. They've been fighting very hard on it and having a lot of success in the states where there's complete Republican control of the state house and the legislature, less success in Congress because of the Senate being controlled by Democrats. So even though the Catholic Church wants this to be an issue of religious freedom, the people who agree with them want this to be about reproductive rights. Yeah, right. And so when you have an advisor for Rick Santorum say you should have a bare you know, aspirin you know, between your legs and the things that um, you know, Santorum has said, they basically just took it away from right. the Catholic Church attempt right. to frame it because the, the people who carry it are not interested, they're not interested in it as a religious freedom issue. The other issue is that um, your average voter doesn't think it's a religious freedom. They don't think it's an issue of religious freedom. And I was mentioning earlier that um, I've done some, did some polling on this for Planned Parenthood um, last week. And when you talk about, in particular, this, this rule um, uh, under the um, Affordable Care Act, and you ask about coverage of birth control, about 55% of people support it. When you add the religious compromise um, that, not just the compromise that ultimately came out of it, but the one that's in there, that was already in there, mm -hmm. support goes down five points you still have majority support. And it's because you can't convince Republicans that Democrats are going to do anything around protecting religious freedom, so you don't get any points with them. Mm -hmm. And your pro-choice and progressive voters don't like the religious exemption, so you actually lose ground <laughs> when you start talking about the religious exemption on at least coverage of, of birth control. Mm -hmm. I still can't believe that what we're discussing here is birth control and not the Mormon church. I was all geared up to be doing stories about, you know, um, Mormon theology and, uh, you know, Mitt Romney having uh, served as a Mormon bishop and what does that mean? And it's almost as though that has vanished. Um, why is it? And is it possible to unpack it all? I mean, you, you, Anna talked a little bit about how hard it is to tweeze out why um, 
and particularly evangelical voters might not uh, vote for Mitt Romney? Is it that he's not sufficiently conservative, or is it his, uh, you know, is it his church affiliation? But what what do you think is is going on? Is there any are there any indications that it's not an issue because it's not an issue for people that it's really not they're not bothered by this? I think it depends on who your surrogates are, because as a candidate, it's very dangerous to sort of pick up. If you're a Catholic Newt Gingrich, you don't want to be the one who picks up the religion issue uh, for fear that you're going to get whacked back on some level, because there still is, in some southern states particularly, uh, in an, a potential anti-Catholic vote. So you don't want to be stirring up those waters too easily. So that then puts you in the position of relying on surrogates. And I think early... I, I, I'll tell you a story. Uh, I teach a course on religion politics, and I had a very bright Harvard Law student five years ago who came to me at the end of the term and said, I want to write my paper on a hypothetical Mormon running for the presidency and how he would hypothetically address hypothetical evangelical voters. And I said, well, hypothetically, I'd be delighted to see the paper. <laughs> so instead of a 15-page paper, he gave me a 65-page memo about how to do this. And what, he, what the memo said was, Stay on issues, don't discuss religion. Mm -hmm. Stay on issues, don't discuss religion. Well, he was hired by a non-hypothetical Mormon <laughs> candidate. <laughs> I knew you were going there. <laughs> a, few, uh, uh, a few weeks after uh, he finished the course. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that Romney, early on, understood he needed to stay on issues, stay off religion, stay on issues, and then let's see whether the others would dare to take him on. And they didn't. Well, when a majority of the people in Mississippi say that Barack Obama is a Muslim, right. I, I think that, that says something about the cross currents that we're seeing in this electorate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think some of it is particular to Romney. He's really, in some ways, overexposed. People are very, he ran for president in 2008. He was the governor of, of uh, Massachusetts, the Olympics, and he's very familiar. And he doesn't, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't scare, scare people. people. And I think that if we had a different candidate who was, you know, I mean, Huntsman probably wouldn't, doesn't scare people either, but, but, um, <laughs> but if it had been somebody different, it might be a different story right now. But he mm -hmm. seems very, he's very comforting. People, even in, in people who don't, I mean, even though he has net negative ratings, when I do focus groups and people talk about him, they talk about being honest, a businessman. They think that he's kind of upstanding. He's a family man. Mm -hmm. The fact that he was a, is or was a bishop and has tied 10%, they actually think speaks well of him. Mm -hmm. So that his his background actually gives him standing um, for you know I'm not I don't do focus groups with Republican primary voters but with you know independent and swing voters and it's mm -hmm. other things that bother him like um, his whether or not he's um, you know consistent and you know switching you know with the wind uh, depending on where he's running and that those are the things that concern around me but the fact that he's a Mormon actually provides some evidence that he has good values as a family man. Mm -hmm. I, I, it'd be interesting to drill down on this a little bit. Uh, uh, and, and the reason that I say that is because, uh, again, going back to Carter in 76, every candidate uh, who has won the presidency had an issue around which they were vulnerable. For Carter, it was being from the South. And the way he, uh, uh, and he had to address it. I mean, you couldn't play like the 800 pound gorilla wasn't on the couch. And it was because of uh, Coretta, uh, Scott King, Jesse Hill, Andy Young, and that crowd that had civil rights credentials <coughs> and bona fides that said, he's a southerner, he's a peanut farmer, but he's our guy. Uh, and, uh, you know, with, with Clinton, it was, the, you know, some other issues. And uh, with Obama, it was race. With Obama, it was race. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the thing that everybody dreaded was something like Reverend Wright. But that really is the thing that inoculated him on that issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that the fact that, that, that there hasn't been more of a discussion about Mormonism within the context of this electoral cycle is going to be the thing that will lead to Romney's undoing uh, mm. if it's not taken uh, head on. Mm. Well, 
but if you bring up the, con the concept of multiple wives, then immediately it swings to Gingrich, not to Romney. <laughs> so, you know, you got, well, how do you... Maybe that's how it? he inoculates. Um, there we go. There you go. <laughs> I think that's true. Yeah, yeah. I think there's some truth to that. Yeah. 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 Well, the most, um, I, I think the most incisive thing I've heard um, about uh, Mitt Romney's church affiliation came from Richard Land, who is um, with the Southern Baptist yeah. Convention, and he's a kind of a political player uh, in Washington. He's a lobbyist. But he, uh, he said that the problem with Mitt Romney is not that he's a Mormon. It's for, you know, for conservative evangelicals' point of view. Uh, it's not that he's a Mormon. It's that he is not sufficiently Mormon. Mm -hmm. Because if he were, he would be more conservative, um, especially on you know, morality issues, uh, more consistently conservative. So um, this has been a great discussion. We know that a lot of people here have come with questions, so we want to give people an opportunity to ask those questions. There are, what, two, there's a microphone here, one there, one there. Oh, good, that helped. <laughs> Having the lights up, one there. And if people want to line up behind the microphones, when it's your turn at the microphone, if you can uh, introduce yourself or just say your name. And um, please make sure you ask a question and not uh, give us a speech, because if you do, I will get in your way. <laughs> so, um, and uh, let us know who you'd like to direct the question to as well. I'm uh, Charlie Clements from the uh, Car Center here. And uh, my question is to any of the panelists, but uh, do you think that in the, um, the general election, the issue that uh, it might have been that same gentleman from the Baptist Convention, I don't remember who, who it was, but somebody said, my problem with him is not that he's a Mormon, it's that he's not Christian, because they're kind of trying to, to really be, separate Christianity mm -hmm. from Mormonism, which seemed like it could be a pretty divisive issue. So does anybody think that that's going to surface as an issue? Who would like to take that? Well, uh, 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 Richard Land, uh, I, I, I don't think, made that statement. He it would not, not have. No. I, I know Richard. We served on the, the commission Maybe together. That's right. Mm -hmm. But uh, Reverend Franklin Graham uh, has yeah. made such a statement. Uh, and this goes back to my point that uh, unless this issue is, is, is taken, uh, confronted head on, it becomes a subtext, uh, and because it's never addressed, uh, you don't calculate, you can't calculate the full impact until Election Day. Of course, it's too late then. Right. I mean, well, I think that when he, uh, because I still believe that Mitt Romney will be the nominee, we don't know. What, what kind of conversation there's going to be about the fact that he's a Mormon. And right now people are, you know, talking about this primary and you've got a lot of interesting things that happened around all the candidates that has been a distraction from that conversation potentially. But once Romney is the nominee, if he is the Romney, it doesn't mean, I mean, we may still have that discussion. And to your point, if we haven't, it may be, if it's not, if, if the conversation is not productive for him, it may be happening too late in the cycle. It may be a problem. Mm -hmm. But the issue is, there'll be a choice between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, mm -hmm. and I think that will cause a lot of folks to lay aside concerns they may have about right. the fact that Romney's a Mormon. The unspoken race issue versus the yeah. unspoken yeah. Mormon, Mormon issue, yeah, <laughs> right. right. See, I don't think that it's so much a problem for Obama that the Mormon issue is unspoken, because it's an issue that affects voters that are predisposed to vote for a Republican mm -hmm. candidate, and it only moves in Obama's direction well, right. in terms of holding down a Republican vote. It does affect voter enthusiasm, though. And, I mean, well, turnout I think that's, has been down, yeah, and if you look at the turnout, right, right, and all these Republican private turnout has been down. Right. And so it may, you know, impact turnout. It may be affecting the turnout, turnout. yeah. Oh, all the turnouts are down. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, interesting. All right. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'm Robert Nichols, and uh, I'm not sure where, where, who to address it to. I know Richard too well, so uh, may, maybe I'll throw it open. But it's the question of Christian values. We've talked about religion in, in, the, in politics, but the sense of values doesn't seem to have come up anywhere. The sense that you, uh, of what happens to the poor, the visiting of the, pr the prisoners, of all sorts of things that one might think of at least as Christian values. I shouldn't say religious values. And I wonder if anybody would care to well, say... Yeah. So this is the place missing mainline that, voter right here. Okay. Yeah, this yeah, is, yes, this is that right. other yeah. Protestant yeah. tradition that mm -hmm. these two gentlemen are you know, I guess what I'd like to say about that is... Uh, what are Christian values and who, who is the spokesperson for Christian values? Because um, my values uh, and the values of a lot of pe people who may identify themselves as evangelical Christians may be very different when it comes to something like food stamps or, or funding for education or 
you know, a whole range of, taxation. of uh, mm -hmm. yeah, taxation and so on and so forth. So I think it's really difficult to, uh, I mean, I think we can talk about values, um, but to talk about Christian values, I think is, is not terribly helpful because there are so many differences that exist within the, you know, the Christian tradition, the Christian faith, and, um, and you know, maybe humanistic values uh, are, are easier to define um, than even Christian values. Mm -hmm. Well, I also think part of the issue is that the denominations that are most likely to advance that version of Christian values are the ones who, that are declining, just in pure numbers terms, mainline Protestant is on the decline. Um, and also institutionally, they're, they're weaker. They don't have the same kind of membership. They don't have the same kind of, you know, they don't have the weekly or more than weekly church attenders. They don't have the same kind of institutional strength. So that voice is harder to be expressed, I think, in our politics. Moreover, you have a bias against politics and church in mainline Protestant churches that you don't have in evangelical churches. So that, you know, the, the, the pastor speaking from the pulpit about a political issue is much less likely to happen in a, in a mainline Protestant church than in an evangelical church. So I just think there's a really, there's a big institutional problem for kind of progressive religious values in yes. American politics. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good question. All right, let's go. Atul Singh, I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Fair Observer. It's a new publication, and hopefully we'll one day rival The Economist. Mm -hmm. So what is the it block? Called? Fair Observer. The idea is to get analysis from around the world, not just one country. Uh, so my question is, and, and this is uh, key for a foreigner like me, is in the UK, which is where I studied and lived, Tony Blair had to hide his faith. It's only after he left office he could declare that I'm converting to Catholicism. And he was a closet Catholic, everyone knew that. Uh, the question here is, why does every candidate have to appear to be religious, whether Democrat or Republican in the US? Everyone, including Barack Obama. Why is it still the case? Well, so, so I teach a semester-long course in that, and if you have time, <laughs> some of the students here would be glad to, I think some of my students are here would be glad to talk to you. I don't think that's answerable in under uh, several minutes. <laughs> Can uh, you try? <laughs> but it, well, it, go, it goes to the history of, of America. It's and tradition. The, yeah, it's this, tradition. Yeah, this, this was a country founded as an idea, and a lot of those ideas were fed by people who came with religion as part of the markers of their identity, and partly as what their hope was for what America could become. And so religion has always played an important part of, uh, in the life of, uh, uh, of American politics. Tocqueville wrote extensive parts of Democracy in America discussing the role of religion in American public life. Uh, European religious institutions went into the decline in the early 19th century in the aftermath of the French Revolution, took a series of blows after that as a consequence in Catholic countries of the syllabus of errors, in Protestant countries through industrial. There's a whole different story here in which religion plays a proxy for class, it plays as a proxy for ethnic group, plays as a, as a proxy for occupation, so that religion plays a much more important role in the United States than it does in virtually any other, any other uh, industrialized Western country. Mm -hmm. The way and, it is. And, and I would add, and I mean to pick up on this historical theme, uh, uh, you know, we lament this kind of turn toward fundamentalism that we're seeing expressed now. But uh, the, uh, Christianity has had some very bright and shining moments within the context of the American experiment uh, in terms of driving it. The, the, the abolition movement uh, was driven by the, the church. Uh, the civil rights movement uh, was driven by uh, the, the church. Uh, and these are good things. Uh, and I think that we, we've had uh, more shining moments than dark hours. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the, the, the other th things about this kind of institutional and, uh, uh, and, and cultural rootage of the church uh, in uh, this country uh, has uh, continued to punctuate the importance of, of religion and politics. Uh, but I'd add a, 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 another caveat, and Governor, and may, maybe this will resonate with you, and maybe it won't. Being the president is a pretty big job. It's a pretty big job, to put it, to put it lightly. And uh, I, I quite frankly 
don't see how you can be president effectively without going to the prayer closet every once in a while. Mm. I mean, the, the enormity of the decisions that you have to make. I mean, as a, the, the chief executive, I mean, you've got a cabinet. Uh, and so it means that most of the decisions that come to your desk or like, oh my God, decisions. <laughs> you know, because you, you've, got, you've got a host of other people to handle everything else. Uh, and so I think you know, it's, it's kind of that intuitive the predisposition, which also kind of feeds uh, our comfort with this kind of symbiosis between politics and religion. But the thing that bothers me uh, is, is, is the fact that religion is being used as a political weapon. And it is polarizing. Now, I know it has always been that way, and it doesn't need necessarily be, to be that way. But f from my point of view, that's the way it is today in this country. There is it's almost like a religious war going on. And, um, and, and I, think that's, I, th I think that's harmful. Mm -hmm. And I think the question was a good one. Why do political people, uh, they're, they're almost obligated to express a personal faith or a personal belief system. And um, we are a pluralistic society. It, it um, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I have very mixed feelings about that mm -hmm. because there's a part of me that says that that ought not to be uh, any kind of test. Now, if, it, if it's just simply a part of a biography so that people feel like they know the candidates and have some sense of, of their life experiences and so on, that's one thing. But to express a theological position uh, as, a, as a way to try to win votes, I, I just find that troublesome. Mm -hmm. well, you know, look, democracy is messy. It is. <laughs> and and, and you religion know, is messy. Uh, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's precisely right. And so I think, and the you know. combination is not even to be thought about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you multiply negative times the negative, you get a positive. There we go. There we go. There we go. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, it, it's okay to be uncomfortable sometimes uh, as we practice uh, our, 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 our politics. You know, again, we can't, we can, I don't think we can get away from it. And, and as a, an ordained uh, uh, United Methodist uh, uh, minister, I'm the, the head of church for a while, but I still preach every once in a while. But like right uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, th these roots, uh, you know, run, run deep. You know, endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. You know, all our yes. currency in God. We, these roots are deep. I don't, and I don't I, think I we ought to run from them. I understand that, preacher, but. Okay. The, the, there's a difference between <laughs> ritual speech and policy speech. Yes. And I, I think we could find some ground. Okay, if this is ritual speech, let it go forward. But policy speech is, I think, what's concerning you, and I think it concerns. But I was in Congress, and I was sitting there as President Bush was being sworn in, and I believe it was Franklin Graham, sure, who, who was, you know, praying. Mm -hmm. And and as I recall, these may not be the exact words, but as I recall, he said. In the, in, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And I'm thinking, he's praying for this nation. We are a pluralistic right. nation. And that's excluding a lot of people. And, I, I, you know, I just felt like that that was not really appropriate. But mm -hmm. see, that's ritual speech, which you said should go forward. Well, it, but, Rick, but, Rick Warren was the, uh, the more recent one giving an invocation, right. so we haven't come that far right. from Franklin Graham but, in terms but, but of the other evangelicals. Point, I mean, so. a kind of counterpoint to this, you know, I'm a, a card-carrying Democrat, but when Bush, I was, I was in uh, South Africa when he gave uh, his State of the Union address, I want to say it was 2000, uh, uh, it was second, second or third, it was probably the second. Uh, 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 State of the Union address, and he talked about dealing with HIV/AIDS in Africa. And uh, he actually uh, departed from his script because I asked him about it. And uh, he started to speak theologically about the obligation that a country as wealthy as ours, that the the that, that we have an obligation to care for the least of those in our midst. Right. 
And he said that if we don't get out front and dealing with this issue of HIV AIDS in Africa, God shame on us. Mm -hmm. I remember. Uh, I and it was no by far with that. It was by far yeah. the, the most, most free, far reaching. That's three Methodists in agreement. How yeah. Yeah. Be? <laughs> yeah. But this, mean. this whole discussion is really shows you the extent to which this is the use of religion and whether it is a positive or a negative yeah. is so much in the eye of the beholder. Because you talk about abolition, and I can tell you that you know when I interview people who are involved in the anti-abortion movement, they will call it a modern-day abolition movement. They will liken it also to uh, ending a holocaust, mm -hmm. and in their view, that is you know that's the work that they're doing. It's good work. It's uh, what you know what Jesus would want, and uh, it's righteous work. So um, I ask us all just to you know keep keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, so that was a great question. It kicked off a great discussion, but I want to um, go to another. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to ignore you up in the balcony there. So your turn. Hi, my name is Luke Scanlon. I'm actually Professor Parker's student, one of his classes. I'm looking forward to getting that A on my midterm, sir. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear what the question is. Oh, the, the question. I'm getting back to that. OK. So my name is Luke Scanlon. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm back. Uh, so I am. I am the president of the Harvard Tea Party here. I am from Texas. I am a student leader in the Tea Party group nationwide. Um, and so I'm also an evangelical Christian and having gone to church in the South and now come to church up North, it, there's a dramatic difference in views and how people perceive their faith and how the rhetoric is used in expressing that, not just in the church, but in just around. And so one of the things to the governor's point is, and I think Professor Parker clarified it well, is that are we dealing with a ritual discussion or are we dealing with a political weapon almost? I don't want to view my faith as a political weapon. It's a personal belief that I have. So my question comes to, in politics, I think, Governor, your point is, do I, is it a biography? Do I want to get to know somebody better? And if someone tells me where they believe I feel much better about it. And the question is? The question is, I was getting to it. The question is, what can we do in our rhetoric in the media and publicly? How can we change our rhetoric to not make it such a polarizing, a branding weapon um, and, and clean up the political argument? And I mean, not just on CNN, but even in forums like this and in schools like this. I mean, it's such a vibrant and searing topic. You go one way someone uh, in a direction that someone doesn't want to hear it and all of a sudden you know you're demonized and it's just really really bad i mean how can we change that rhetoric as a country and accept you know who we are and who we're becoming okay good question mm -hmm. uh, I, I could answer that question and, and respond to that question in one or two ways i mean one academically and suggest that we ought to take seriously the language of people like ernst trelch uh, and his book is classic, The Social Teachings of the Christian Church. Uh, but in the real world, that probably won't get us too far. Uh, I honestly think that this thing has got to run its course. I think the best thing to get us to a point where we've got a more civil debate and discussion, whether it's using religious language or secular language, is uh, that Rick Santor get the Republican nomination, uh, and that he loses abysmally, and then you'll see a swing in the Republican Party back toward the center, uh, much in the same way we saw, in, and I won't say that these are the moral equivalents, but, but I think politically, I think that, that there's a, an analogy here, but in 72, when we swung so far to the left in the Democratic Party and got trounced with McGovern as our standard bearer, we then started to move to find our way back to the center. Why do I feel like that's not the answer you wanted to hear? <laughs> uh, anyway, no, it's, it's to an answer. A discussion, and I'm, I'm, we're going to. But that is the answer. The balcony here has not heard it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Fair enough. And okay. we can talk later if you'd like. Yeah, please. Okay. It's a good, good. question. Yeah. Your turn. Um, my name is Thomas Frank. I'm a journalist from Austria, uh, right now on a fellowship here in the states. I've got a question for the panel. Uh, what do you make of the fact that of the three Republican candidates in the primary, uh, one is Mormon, Mormon and two are Catholics, and they're wooing for evangelical voters? 
Uh, does that, I mean, how, how, what do you make of that fact? Uh, does it mean that the differences between the religions are less important these days than uh, what they have in common? Question, who wants to take I that? Mean, I mean, I think that what matters in the Republican primary is where you are on these so-called moral or social issues, and it seems to be that it matters less what your actual denomination is. I think it's striking that someone like John McCain was nominated who, as far as I can tell, is not religious at all. To the earlier question about all of our candidates and presidents being religious, I actually don't think that's true. I actually don't think President Obama is religious. He doesn't belong to a church, and he goes maybe once a month um, and never talks about it. So I actually think it's not the case <laughs> that they're all um, religious or, or um, at least uh, want to be perceived that way. But, you know, John McCain, um, was not religious at all. I'm not even sure. I'm sure he's a Protestant. I don't even know what his he's religion is. He's Episcopalian. So okay. He may or may not be right. So, religious. so I actually think what so matters far more in the Republican <laughs> primary is, you know, where you are on on the issues, um, than it is what your actual denomination is. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I'd oh. make a variant comment on that, which is, the intensity of religious walls between denominations is much lower today than 50 years ago. Yes. Certainly much lower than 100 years ago in American political life, and, and I think her point is, is exactly the right one, that in these primaries where you have a subset of a subset of voters, it's the issues that are driving the choices, not the denominational affiliations. And the fact that we thought that being Mormon would disqualify Mitt Romney with evangelical voters and what the results have been, I think, speak to exactly, mm -hmm. exactly that. My name is Amy Jeffrey, and I'm asking a question on behalf of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Um, as a lot of students in the audience are interested in pursuing politics in the future, what do you see as the role of religion and politics in future election cycles? Well, I, I think that the role of religion changes constantly depending uh, on, on the, where the country is. I mean, I, I made the point earlier that there have been three religious right cycles in the 20th century, and this is at the very tail end. It may even be the echo back period from the third cycle. Uh, and it'll depend, I think, a lot, in, uh, importantly, on the fastest growing sector, you know, the, so, uh, the, the fastest growing religious block in America today, which is the non-affiliated. Uh, one of the really interesting consequences of the great push of the white evangelical community in the, in the 80s and 90s uh, was based on a claim that they were growing dramatically. Well, the data doesn't suggest that they've grown at all as a share of total American population. They're about where they were at the start of this whole cycle. And the one group that has grown dramatically by two to two and a half times are the non-affiliated. Now, a lot of them are coming from the mainline Protestant churches, but they're coming from all over. And there's good reason to believe that among young people in particular, the disaffiliation is because religion has been associated with this particular brand of politicized Christian evangelical conservatism. Uh, so what will happen in the, in the next 20 years is going to be largely in a, 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 a function of how your generation and the next after it continues to make that judgment that religion means conservatism. And in particular, for younger women, that religion means conservatism about women's bodies in ways that women don't want to agree with. So Can I just add I think to that's that, huge. That, that the other big change is immigration yes. and the growing diversity of this country, and you have many people who either are coming here from very diverse religious backgrounds where the church or other institution, religious institutions play a very different role in politics right. in those countries, and even the, 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 the generation that's born here from those families have a very different relationship to the religious institutions that they come from. So I imagine you know, in 50 years that this could look like something, you know, we can't even imagine what it, what it looks like because the growing diversity of this right. country right. brings in a very different worldview about the role that religious institutions yeah. play. My name is Rod, and I'm a volunteer with both the uh, Occupy Boston movement and the Tea Party movement. And the Venn diagrams of those two movements yeah. overlap a lot more than uh, the corporate media might uh, lead you to believe. Um, one of the more well-known alumni around here, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, was famously described by someone at, that, uh, as, well, quote, if you were to distill Theodore down to his essence, what you would eventually find is the militant church, or the church militant. Mm -hmm. And uh, while 
um, discussion of social issues uh, can be probably uh, uh, informed by uh, religious understanding and the teachings of a church uh, w with good result, uh, better than, again, corporate media often give it credit for. When Roosevelt was describing uh, and advancing what he called the new nationalism, uh, he was principally addressing the problems uh, that are familiar to us of corporate parasitism, of corporatism run amok. And by the way, if there's anyone here who has not yet seen the documentary, An Inside Job, please do. And, and do take careful notes and apply them to great letters to the editor, pl All right, won't you? so your question is? My question is, um, that is a, an application of Christian understanding, um, and, and not just by Roosevelt. Um, and I'm wondering what you folks think are the prospects in this election for that understanding to be brought to bear meaningfully. Thank you. Sure. Well, I, I think, first of all, I mean, Roosevelt, like uh, his successor, Woodrow Wilson, was riding the crest of the progressive era. The progressive era had been born out of the social gospel movement in the Protestant mainline churches in the late 19th century. And the fact that those presidents both were Protestant mainliners is representative of a time when white Protestantism of the mainline kind was politically dominant in the United States outside the South. That's no longer true. And so it's difficult to look back on a specifically Protestant social gospel, a mainline Protestant social gospel tradition as the possible source of a new iteration of that same kind of politics. Whether or not there is a foundation that draws on religious moral values, that draws from Catholic social justice, from, uh, from uh, uh, Jewish uh, justice traditions, as well as uh, Protestant traditions uh, in the social gospel movement, that's a different story. That's a different story. But it can't any longer look to mainline Protestantism to serve as the engine to drive that politics. I mean, I, there may well be a critique of corporate America in this election, but it will come as a reaction, I think, to Citizens United and super PACs and the role that corporate donations play in policy making. And you see that articulated somewhat by the president, though, as <laughs> he gets more populist. He right, gets more yeah. populist as it gets closer to election day. <coughs> um, and, but you see it in, in, but at, at the state level, where you have a bunch of Republican governors, um, you know, including in Ohio, <laughs> where these corporate donors are playing a huge role in policy making. I just don't know that it comes from necessarily a faith tradition, this critique. But I think it's quite possible it'll be a big part of this election. So I, I was going to. Um, ask a question uh, off of this, which is, is there a religious left left? Is re religious sure. left a factor at all? And uh, who are they? And where do we see them visible? I think, th I think they exist. I, I'm, I, I'm disappointed they're not more um, out front in terms of av advocacy. But there, there, is, there, is a, there is a religious left. Uh, it's pretty d dormant, though, don't you think? Yeah. Is that what you're finding with your polling? Well, I just think that there, I mentioned earlier, there's an institutional problem with the religious left. So both at the level of their constituency, their churchgoers aren't as religious, if you will, as the um, churchgoers on the right. Mm -hmm. And so whether that's a source of bodies or donations or energy or communication networks, um, mobilization networks, it just don't have the infrastructure. So you have some very prominent people who talk about um, you know, the budget is a moral document, and mm -hmm. talk about mm -hmm. um, social justice, and talk about caring for the poor. But you don't have the same institutional foundation right. for it, so it's very hard to have influence if you don't have an, kind of an institutional base. The labor movement is really the institutional base on the left, such as it is. I mean, it's obviously on the decline, but that's really the only base on the left. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, let, let, let me take, take issue at, 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 okay. this, at this point, uh, that uh, you don't have the same sort of, of, of power at the denominational level mm -hmm. uh, that we saw during the social gospel era today. But having said that, uh, you do have a, a vibrant prophetic tradition that is still alive. You see it in mm -hmm. uh, African American churches, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, the uh, uh, urban areas around the country. Uh, and, uh, Laurie, I think you ma made the point earlier about the diminution of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Pat Robertson crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, the Christian Coalition. Christian Coalition. 
Uh, well, one of the things that's, that's been some that I found somewhat interesting. I like the Pat Robinson crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what he was saying. <laughs> is that you? You had some of those folks on the evangelical side, uh, like and I, his name escapes me, but at, at the Saddleback Church. Rick Warren. Rick, Rick Warren. Warren. Yeah. Who? Uh, I remember things. Who who who, <laughs> who 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 started moving much more. Uh, in keeping with a tradition reflective of, of Martin King in terms of his approach to some of these issues. You know, that, that the eval evangelical church, yet we have our issues around piety that we need to address and, the, you know, the personal religious experience. But, uh, you know, the gospel causes, calls us to stand with the oppressed. So... Uh, you know, while it might not be completely above the radar, you know, there are some things uh, happening, mm -hmm. which is why at points along the way, uh, the president will show up in some churches right. Right. as he moves around this country, uh, as will the eventual Republican nominee. Mm -hmm. the, um, the Occupy movement has uh, its own chaplains. So, can, can and those ask, are, and, and for the most I, part, those are the religious left. Uh, can we let these guys ask the questions? Yeah, I want to ask the question, <laughs> okay. I don't, and I don't even care who answers it. Okay. Uh, but this is a very, a very interesting point that was made about the role of super PACs, and if somebody, if, you know, some entity is going to discredit, uh, you know, corporate America and its uh, dominance uh, over. Uh, the, the political conversation, that, that that's where it'll come from. Given that we're talking about politics and religion, would we prefer that prophetic response to come from super PACs, or would we prefer it to come from the church? Mm. Is that I, a loaded I, question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's not I, really a loaded question. I, I, don't, know, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a very existential. All right. yeah. not, not too many churches with that kind of money. <laughs> All right. Your Hello, <clears throat> my name is Matt Stolhansky, and my question is, um, I just want a little bit of clarity around what appears to be an apparent kind of incongruency between two themes that you've hit on tonight. The first is sort of the surprising um, truth, not to me, but I think to most, that the Republicans are actually, they, f they don't really care that much about religious denomination affiliation, um, given um, John McCain and, you know, what looks to be the likely Republican nominee, Mitt Romney. And what appears to be another theme that's been hit on here, which is that the Republicans are the apparent religious party or the apparent you know, theological party, mm -hmm. even just suggesting the question of like, are there even, is there even a religious left left in the country? Um, so my question is, how do you rectify that? Why aren't Republicans getting more credit for being a people, for, for being a party that, uh, that chooses its nominees on the basis of their principles and not so much on the basis of their denomination or their faith? Mm, very interesting. Well, part of it is that the positions that they take coming from that those traditions are somewhat outside of the mainstream of the general electorate. So it's hard, I mean, if you take, go back to contraception, there is a consensus in this country about contraception, and you have a set of positions being articulated by the Republican primary candidates and other Republicans around the country that is, you know, antithetical to that position. So I'm not sure how they would sort of get credit, even if it's coming from a place of, of piety and faith, when the positions they take, ten, at least on the social issues, with the exception of abortion, which really is different, I think, than whether it's LGBT issues or mm -hmm. women's health, they are sort of at odds with where sort of the average American is. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Samuel Odama. Um, I'm affiliated with the Graduate School of Education. Um, growing up in Dallas, Texas, I used to listen to a radio show where uh, it was said. Um, Politics determine how we live here on earth. Religion determines how we live forever. And I thought that was very interesting. But tonight, I want to I, I wanna point out that it strikes me that uh, there's not a lot of uh, conservative voice on the panel this evening. You know, I understand that we're at Harvard. Just keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> but um, Governor Strickland, I want to ask, does not one's faith influence and inform their decision to, to serve and to enter public life? Well, one's values do, and, and many people have their values rooted in their faith, um, but not everyone who has strong values ha has strong faith. Um, the first speech I gave 
when I decided to run for governor, uh, I, I, I called myself the golden rule Democrat. That's, you know, has religious overtones, I guess, but, um, uh, and, and just let me say this, I, <clears throat> I went to a Christian college where we prayed before every class. Um, I went to a theological seminary that, you know, that taught that uh, the Bible was the inerrant word of God. Um, and, and so I, I'm not, I'm not uh, disrespectful of those who harbor those beliefs, but I do believe that this country is so diverse and so pluralistic that we've, you know, we've got to include all citizens. Uh, and uh, when you're in political office or when you're seeking political office, it is my opinion that you should have an inclusive attitude and, and outreach um, to people who believe as you do or people who don't believe as you do. Uh, and so that's, that's part of the answer to this young man's question up here, I think, is how can we, how can we uh, diminish the hostility of the dialogue? Mm -hmm. And that's to show respect for, for uh, the kind of diversity that exists within our, our country and, and not you know, try to limit um, our definition of what is, uh, what's a good person and a bad person based on what it is that they believe. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Feng. I ha I'm a, another student in Professor Parker's class <laughs> of religion and <laughs> politics. And I've heard uh, about the uh, story, this uh, the, uh, uh, unhypothetic 65-page <laughs> paper on a hypothetical Mormon running a, uh, <laughs> for a president. Uh, I could, couldn't wait to see that paper <laughs> myself <laughs> for the leader. But, um, Knowing that Romney uh, has been the front runner all the time, and uh, knowing that uh, Mormonism so far hasn't been an open issue yet, uh, but uh, we also know, at least I, I personally feel, that uh, there's always a, a persistent resistance against no, um, Romney's nomination in the Republican. Now, my question is very uh, point blank. Given everything else is equal, if Romney were not a Mormon, might he have already locked mm. in his nomination by now? Very That's good an interesting question. question. Very good question. What do you think? Uh, I think that if he weren't, weren't worshiping in the church of flip-flop, he would already have. I think, I, I'm quite serious. Right. I, do, I think that the ability to tag him with the flip-flop uh, accusation has done him more damage with these voters who tend to dislike uh, variability uh, uh, on issues uh, more than his Mormonism. But that's my read. I, I agree, and I think that it, to, to Republican primary voters, it's an indicator that he's not conservative enough. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a good yeah. question. Okay. Looking back around. This is actually a little, I'm sorry, my name is Zach Sullivan. I'm a first year grad student here at the Kennedy School. This is actually a little bit of a follow up to Daniel's question. Um, we, you know, one of the criticisms levied against Mitt Romney is that he can be very wooden. It cannot be really clear what he believes in. Do you think that if he, had t if he was talking more openly about his faith, would that help him with this sense that he doesn't believe any in anything? Or are, are the risks still too great? No, because the narrative structure of Mormonism is too unfamiliar to too many of his base voters. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that was, no, it would be very dangerous. It, Mormonism has a complex narrative structure that is grafted onto the complex narrative structures of the Old Testament and New Testament. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament and New Testament are complex narrative structures <laughs> that have been around long enough that they don't look unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. The narrative structure of Mormonism, which emerges out of the early part of the 19th century and has, has, makes claims and has narratives that are just very unfamiliar and jarring, uh, would just play havoc with his base vote. So no. No, but he could talk about it just being a faithful person that, that, and his faith right. in God and right. to the question about the role that faith plays in entering into public life without talking about the particulars of Mormon theology. And I'm well, actually, he gave that speech in Texas. He did, didn't he? And, yeah. but it was a long time ago. I mean, well, he used to okay. give it again. It, I mean, again. it wasn't there like last right. summer. I mean, it was, but it was well before all of his problems have emerged that right. I think relate to him being a flip flopper, not consistent, not conservative. So that kind of 
speech given later might have helped him more. That's probably right. Okay. okay. Um, I'm going to take the moderator's privilege to ask, ask you all a last question, um, which is, and we've hinted yeah. at it a little bit about the growth, the big, the, the most quickly growing sector um, are the nuns, and this is not Catholic nuns, these are N-O-N-E-S, religious, uh, the religiously unaffiliated, right? Not, yes, not, not nuns and priests. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, with the, in, in 10 years, I think, almost doubling, we're about at, what, 15%? Yeah, more, more than doubling, yeah. And uh, that's at the general population. <coughs> you look at, um, you know, younger generations, it's uh, even greater. It, do you foresee a day when, um, you know, we'll see a president who's an, uh, we would elect a president who's an openly atheist? Is, are we... Will we get there? I think we only have one self-identified atheist in the entire Congress of the That's United right. States of America. I think there are probably some closet atheists there. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know them. <laughs> uh, I, I, I doubt if it will happen uh, in my lifetime, but I'm <laughs> quite old, so. Um, uh, but I... Uh, I, I do believe that what has happened with the, the intermingling of, of religion, religion and politics so that it has become so p politically divisive has been uh, not good for the, for the politics, and I don't think it's been good for the church. Mm -hmm. I think the church has suffered, and, and maybe that's one of the reasons uh, I'd be interested in your opinion, that, that, that there are more nuns now because people have been turned off oh, by what they yeah. have seen as a, as a use of, of religious faith in, in ways that are unacceptable to them. Right. It's very hard to grow up in a generation that thought of religious dialogue as being something that Abraham Heschel and John Courtney Murray and Reinhold Niebuhr carried out, mm -hmm. that had a level of seriousness and a commitment to America as a pluralist civilization, and what passes now for that same discussion in America today. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's done enormous damage mm -hmm. to America mm -hmm. and, well, and, to, and to the adherence mm -hmm. levels. Putting on my political consultant hat, um, when I work with candidates, I work with plenty who are, they may not tell me they're atheists, but it's pretty clear that they are nuns. And what we try to do with them when they tell their story, what their narrative is, to have some defining moment, anecdote, story that indicates what their values are. And it can be a, a story that comes from you know, something that has to do with the religious arena or not. And I think that those kinds of stories are going to become more and more. I mean, I think for you know, President Obama, it was you know, grassroots organizing was kind of the indicator of what his core values were, more so than even though he gave his speech on his church and, and race and there was a religious theme to it, I actually think that that kind of was his story about where his values came from and, and how he came to have the priorities that he had. And I think you'll see more and more um, candidates and politicians who have kind of a, their story of how they came to have their values that doesn't right. come from a religious place. And there are plenty who are running for Congress, and not running for president, but plenty running for other kinds of offices where there's almost no discussion of people's um, faith background. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, th I, I think that the, the potential uh, for us to elect someone who's atheist or agnostic is uh, very real. You know, now, will it happen in the next election cycle? Probably not. But for me, the more profound question, or should I say equally profound question, is when might we elect the first Muslim president? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that, I mean, you know, that's... Some people but, believe we already but, have. But, you know, that's right. But, <laughs> But, you know, I mean, and, and, I, and I think to, to start to entertain that question seriously mm. moves us very close to a point that was a, a, a text of your first campaign for governor when you called yourself the Golden oh. Rule mm -hmm. Democrat. That's not implicitly religious. It's explicitly religious. And, you know, the really great thing about it is that it's a principle that is at the root of every major religion. Every major religion and philosophical tradition has some articulation of the golden rule. 
And if we start to see that as the translucent thread that runs throughout, then we'll be at that place uh, where we aspire to go to which this young man inferred and to which uh, hopefully this discourse got us closer to appreciating and understanding. Mm -hmm. Well, this was, I'm, I'm sorry to those of you who didn't get a chance to ask your questions. Um, I'm sure they're good ones, but uh, the ones we did hear were terrific, and this was really just a great discussion. I want to thank you all for well spent. You know, boy, that was really.